Okay, this is chapter 16 of The Night Singer. 16. Hannah kicked off her shoes without bending down to untie them. You'll ruin them, she heard Baby Ann's voice telling her. Untie them properly. She dropped her keys onto the small chest of drawers in the hallway and another request from the past suddenly came to mind. This time, it was from her mother. Would you please move those? The words were followed by a smile and a, do it for me. Her mother had always refused to put keys on any kind of table. And she didn't like it when other people did so either. It was bad luck, apparently. Hannah remembered only the words in her smile, not her mother's voice. That had been the first thing to disappear. She picked up the keys and hung them on the hook beside the mirror instead, heading through to the kitchen and opening the fridge. She wasn't looking forward to telling Rebecca about the drugs they had found in Joel's room. The conversation they'd had after she told Rebecca that Joel was dead had left a sour taste in her mouth. The way she had exploited both the shock and their old friendship. Perhaps she shouldn't be the main point of contact with Rebecca after all. Still, however hard it was for each of them, Hannah believed it was good for the investigation. She took out the plastic tub of chicken casserole. It was the last portion of the big bat she had cooked on Sunday. She had eaten it every day since. Hannah shoved the tub into the microwave. Along with the table and chairs, it was her sole contribution to the kitchen. Charming and authentic were two of the many words the real estate agent had used to describe the place. The floral wallpaper was probably at least 20 years old, and the cabinets were tired and lopsided. Still, she liked it and had no plans to rip it out and start again. After tipping the hot kitchen casserole onto a plate, Hannah carried it through to the living room. There were three rooms on the ground floor and she had decided to make one of them into the dining room not that she really needed one the best thing would be to knock down a wall and make herself a decent sized living room instead aside from the tv all she could fit in the current one was a sofa upstairs there were two bedrooms they should probably be knocked through to make one room too five rooms in total coming to just under 50 square meters Strictly speaking, the house was bigger than that, but the sloping ceilings on the second floor brought down the amount of usable space. When she finished eating, Hannah called her brother. Hi, Christopher answered. His tone of voice felt like a straight jacket around her heart. It was obvious he was still angry with her. How are you all? she asked. We're fine. Ella had chicken pox about last week, but it's cleared up now. Good. Hannah and Christopher had both had the chicken pox as children. She was 10 and he was 11, but she could still remember how itchy it was. She hoped Ella suffered less than they had. It was supposed to be milder for younger children. Hannah had only met her niece once when Ella was one. She had just learned to walk and could now say, Mama, Dada, and no. Could she speak Swedish now? Hannah doubted it. She wanted to suggest that they came to visit, and she suspected Christopher never wanted to set foot on Oland again. Why are you calling? he asked. The question made her airways tighten. He was her brother, but clearly she needed a reason to call him. I started my new job today, she said, with the Kalmar police. Christopher snorted. He'd had this sh fair share of dealings with the police before their father ever got into trouble himself. Shoplifting, being driven home drunk, that kind of thing. Their father's arrest and conviction had been a different kind of turning point for him, and Hannah doubted he would have ever gotten married and found a job in a luxury hotel otherwise. Fragments of their last conversation came back to her, his anger at her decision to move back to the island. You always make it so fucking hard for yourself. For me. All Christopher wanted was to move on and leave the past behind. Yet here she was calling to do the same thing again, to drag him back in time. I spoke to Axel Sandston today. Christopher was silent. You remember him, don't you? Of course I do. I thought you liked him, said Hannah. Not anymore. This time it was Hannah's turn to fall silent. Why had she called? Did she really think Christopher would be able to say anything relevant about Axel after all these years? Why did you speak to him? Christopher asked. As part of an investigation, has he done something? Maybe, maybe not. Did you know he runs a company now? He's a real bigwig in Kalmar these days. Are you surprised? Not really. I just thought he had bigger plans than that. I'm sure he did, said Christopher. But life doesn't always turn out how you planned. Hannah didn't speak. I have to go, said Christopher. We're having dinner. Okay, talk soon, she said, hanging up. In six months or so, she thought with a hint of sadness. She knew she should make more of an effort with Christopher, but she didn't know how. It was like she couldn't do anything right. In a way, their conversation had been a step forward. She hadn't. He hadn't shouted at her, at least. 
Hannah missed Christopher almost more than she had missed her parents. He was just 14 months older than her, and they had been so close when they were younger. When their mother died, however, he and their father had reacted in the same way, by letting go. They both started drinking, dad at home and Christopher out with his friends, even though he was only 13. Hannah had tried desperately to hold the family together, cooking food, making sure the money lasted. Her grandmother was living in an apartment in Farshgen at the time, and she had been helping out where she could. Re restlessness tore at Hannah. She couldn't bear being home alone and decided to go over to Ingrid's instead. Halfway there, she realized the lights were out and changed her mind. She would drive over to Mothelmosen instead. When she reached the rest area, Hannah was surprised to see that she wasn't alone. She parked up the road behind a black Audi with a broken side mirror and climbed out. The forensics team was gone, but the parking lot itself was still taped off, guarded by two officers. Next to the cordon, there were, were a few small groups of people. They had begun laying flowers and lighting candles. A few were talking quietly, but the others were silent. Hannah scanned their faces for Rebecca, but she wasn't there. She felt an urge to get in touch with her, but she was also afraid of intruding, or worse, of being rejected. It felt like she should give Rebecca space right now. Hannah stuck to the sidelines so that no one would try to talk to her. Her gaze fell on a blonde woman. She was the only other person who seemed to have come on her own, and there was a desperation in the way she was hugging herself, in the way she was avoiding the others, as though she thought she had no right to be there. Hannah discreetly pulled out her phone and took a few pictures of the woman and the others. Some perpetrators liked to return to the scene of the crime, after all. Maybe this one would be no different. It was almost nine o'clock and the sun was approaching the horizon. The light was oddly sharp, but the darkness was pressing in from every angle, eager to take over. That included the darkness of the past, the fact that her father had beaten a woman to death, doused her house in gas, and then set it alight. I didn't mean to, Lars had told her on the sole occasion she had brought it up during one of her visits to the prison. During the ten years he was behind bars, Hannah had made around ten trips to... Breckenberg, but it was hard to have a conversation with someone who could barely even look at you, particularly when that person also happened to be your own father. Hannah had written letters, too, about her uneventful life, asking him questions about his. She knew that anything she sent him would be checked, and the realization that other people would read her letters had shaped her choice of words. Communication became an uncomfortable dance around everything they couldn't say. Hannah looked out across the flat, barren landscape at the shadows that were growing longer and longer. The feeling was even stronger than it had been that morning. Nature was alive out here. Maybe it was just that she was too drained of the day. Her phone rang and she cursed herself for forgetting to turn it to silent. She hurried toward her car as she answered, hello? All she could hear was breathing. Hello, she repeated, trying to keep the fear from her voice. There was a click in response.